Good evening. I don't want to make you waiting any, any longer. Um, I don't have a very special role tonight. My name is Nicolas Schaffhausen. I'm the director, and I have that greeting role uh, tonight, which is actually great. Welcome, and the floor is for you. Yeah, thank you very much, Nikolaus, and also welcome from my side to a casual conversation in the frame of the opening of Kate's show, I Can't Nail the Days Down. Uh, Nikolaus already briefly introduced the three of us, but I um, uh, do it in a more extensive way before we start the conversation. So um, I'm very happy to be here with Kate and Axel. Kate studied at the Elam School of Fine Arts at the University of Auckland and received her Doctor of Fine Arts in 2015. She was awarded um, the renowned Walters Prize in 2012. She has had solo exhibitions, including um, galleries and institutions like Michael Ed in Auckland, Lulu in Mexico City, uh, La Loche in Brussels, and mo most recently she participated in the 21st Biennale of Sydney. Kate has undertaken international residencies at the Chinati Foundation in Marfa, Texas, at the Art Pace in San Antonio, Texas, at the Fogo Island Arts Residency in Newfoundland, and the International Studio and Curatorial Program, ISCP, in New York. Kate lives and works in Brooklyn, in New York. Axel Wieder um, is director of the Bergen Kunsthall, as Nikolaus mentioned. Prior to this position, he was director of INDEX, the Swedish Contemporary Art Foundation in Stockholm, from 2014 until 2017. In the past, he worked as curator of exhibitions and head of program at the Arnolfini in Bristol, and was artistic director at the Künstlerhaus Stuttgart. He studied art history at the Humboldt University in Berlin and was one of the founders of Pro Quadratmeter, a bookshop and presentation platform in Berlin with a focus on art theory and urban development. Axel and Kate had worked together on two projects titled The Promise in Bristol and in Stockholm, which included exhibitions, interventions in public space and a public program. And we will also talk about that later on. As the exhibition here at Kunsthalle Wien, um, I can't nail the days on, down, uh, just opens tonight, I suggest that we start a brief description um, of the works on view um, that were all produced here in Vienna or in the surrounding, making use of locally available materials and production sites in and around Vienna. Kate, maybe you could start and elaborate a little bit on the works that we see here, how they were created and what production steps were involved in this project. Thanks, Juliana, and thank you everyone for coming here tonight. What you've seen already, because you stepped directly onto it, is a large brick floor work. One of the things I was most interested in doing is to work with this site and with this glass pavilion in a way that it was a conversation with the site. So I didn't want to include any walls, I didn't want to have any obstruction to the outside. So the work you've stood on and walked over is comprised of about 6,000 bricks. The bricks were worked on when they were green and unfired and we sculpted them. I had um, quite a fantastic support team working with me. And we worked on these for about a week. They went off and got fired. They came back and we've installed them on the ground. Outside on your whatever side, um, <laughs> there is, I call it a drain. It's like a drain or a gutter. And this is a work that was created with clay that we sourced um, from the art school, the University of Applied Arts. And this Clay was collected in the 1970s when they excavated the subway system. And these are all handmade ceramic tiles that have been inserted back into the ground. And then above us here, we have these solid glass works. And my interest in including these was to have something lifted off of the ground and at the same time, something that almost inserted itself into the garden behind us. So the solid glass, in a way, ref 
refracts and reflects the environment and the time of day. So this is what this sort of these lighter elements are hanging here. Um, your interest in that area is not just related to the materials that were available, but also to the sites itself and how the sites are used by people around. Can you maybe tell us a little bit about which aspects in that very area were interesting to you to incorporate in the work also? Sure. Well, I, I came here about a year ago and I had a site visit. And when I was here, I spent a lot of time in this, um, what I call a community garden behind us. And as you can see, there's a type of um, looseness to it. There are seats made out of crates. Um, often there are card there's a lot of cardboard that people have been sitting on. There are plants growing for the restaurant. There is a beehive. There's all sorts of things happening. And I think one of the things that struck me was uh, it was actually a surprise. I wasn't expecting something so informal to be some next to something that was such a formal space. And I think that when I was here, I absolutely wanted to direct the work this direction and this direction because I think there was um, an aliveness. And the work is a conversation. The work doesn't exist on its own. The work is only the work because it's here in the site and in this space. And I think that what I wanted to do was absolutely take over this entire environment, but to include the environment from around me. And on the surface of the bricks, there are things that I've observed during my time in Vienna. There are, there's a lot of mark making that's in reference to that. And there's this type of curiosity that I have when I'm moving through a city that I try to also bring into the work. And I think what I'm really, what I really get excited about is when I start a work and I don't know what it's going to look like. And I had absolutely no idea what this work was going to look like. This was formed through the relationships I, f I had with the people helping me it was informed through the things that I was looking at. It was informed through the denseness of the material and the fact that I couldn't change that. So the work just continually unfolds each day that it goes along. And this is what we have at the end of it. Um, I think it's very interesting that the work not just uh, brings the outside in, but did you also uh, were interested in uh, working outside? So the the train work, the outside work, is just um, um, at the the outside space, which is already a public space. Actually, it's a public garden um, of the city of Vienna. And this aspect of working in public space was also something that um, the two of you um, um, touched on at the the project, the promise in Bristol, and in Stockholm. So. Axel, can you maybe elaborate a little bit um, what was your aim in that project? Yeah. Um, first of all, also welcome and congratulations to Kate especially and to Juliane and to the whole Kunsthalle team for this uh, uh, absolutely amazing exhibition. I'm very happy to have a chance to see it here and to experience it and to celebrate the opening with you. And um, maybe just to say a, a few things about um, this exhibition, The Promise, but maybe also a wider interest uh, that I have and that um, I wanted to address in these projects, uh, which is about um, the city and the city not only understood as a yeah, uh, designed uh, surface or built um, environment or infrastructure, but as a kind of framework in which um, life, um, social activities, interactions and relationships um, happen and express themselves. And um, um, a city is also a kind of um, uh, um, something where we can um, observe how conflicts that um, exist in society, society how they um, express themselves and how they become more concrete and addressable. So in a way, the city um, has played for me, often a role as an important um, object of investigation and um, discussion uh, in order to t talk about um, social political um, issues or yeah, questions. And um, so uh, for this exhibition uh, series, in a way, The Promise, um, we were looking into quite concrete um, sites and questions um, and try to address them um, from various angles, from a very political, direct, uh, almost documentary approach, talking to architects, showing um, uh, traces and objects that relate to 
um, an architectural discourse or um, political struggles and negotiations, but we um, counteracted them with um, uh, artistic gestures or interventions to have um, various levels of uh, a conversation dealing with similar questions um, um, at the same time. Uh, because sometimes um, it feels that uh, one language uh, or one perspective isn't enough. Um, sometimes it's important to talk about political issues very directly, but it's also uh, great to give a bit more space to imagination and to um, maybe a more phenomenolo phenomenological um, uh, look and uh, maybe what Kate describes as feelings, which is obviously not as naive as uh, it might sound at first uh, because feelings are also reflected and are also um, an expression of um, reflection, but um, it addresses a different, um, I don't know, generosity towards one's own um, uh, experiences and um, one's own imagination, I guess. So in this um, series of um, projects, um, The Promise, we um, uh, invited Kate because I really think she's um, an artist who's uh, able to um, produce amazing projects that respond to these um, to, to, to concrete sites and um, deal with um, um, maybe stories and um, hidden layers uh, that exist in a city in a quite uh, yeah, outstanding way. So in Bristol, um, it was um, we realized a, a whole series of projects. Maybe you want to talk a bit about um, the concrete examples, but. Um, it was uh, a series of interventions uh, happening in various sites. One of them was um, uh, a kind of red uh, line on the top of the highest um, office building we could find and get access to. Um, it was a kind of rope uh, wrapped around the top floor of that building as a kind of um, signifier. And in a way, it made that um, building visible, but um, counteracted the harshness and um, uh, I guess business logic of uh, that building with um, something that looked like an improvised uh, drawing. What made you interested in that um, building? Maybe that's a good uh, sure. <laughs> starting point. Uh, so when I, I often take site visits to yeah. come up with ideas and I try to really trust my first response to things. I try not to go away and develop too much. I always, there are ideas and I just, sometimes if I'm in a space, I'm more able to access the things that are around me and pull these into the work. And Bristol has this very strong brutalist history with architecture and there's this one fairly sort of nondescript building that was quite high and didn't seem as cool as all the other buildings, but it was quite high and I had one work that was situated on a bridge and you could see this building from the bridge so there was also this visual tie and what I wanted to do was disrupt this, this whiteness of the building and this sort of correctness and I thought that it could just, I wanted to work with something that was more like a sketched line and there's an image of this work in the booklet that we made because in fact the line of it really reminds me of this line that's outside to our left or right. And I think there's a type of scrappiness that materials can you, can, you can do with materials that you can't really do with architecture or with more fixed things. I'm not wanting to blow anyone away with my work. I'm just wanting to create these quite quiet moments of observation. Yeah, I, I think the, the notion of um, disruption or also action and that the public space is a space of conflict also comes across in your work without being too direct because one of the elements that is inserted in the brickwork on the ground is class charts that we collected over the last couple of weeks uh, here around Karlsplatz. And this idea of that this is something that is on the ground, it is left because as people, people spend time here and that is actually considered as trash or something that's not valuable comes uh, incorporated in your work and gets a new um, value through that. And also um, the idea of the transformation, that um, it is something that is just there because someone was there, someone spent time there, but also that the space changes and that 
it is a struggle indeed what's happening in public space and the idea of transformation I think is also uh, experienced in your work because it will not stay like this like for the brickwork there are all these small loose elements on top of the work so each time someone visits the exhibition they might change a little bit or if you look at the work outside it's exposed to its environment and it will collect um, certain elements from around during the time. Um, maybe you can also tell us a little bit more about how you created the work in order to, to have this idea of movement included in the work, also from the perspective of the viewer. Sure, I, I think it comes back to casualness uh, and I think it comes back to the experience that I have when I move through spaces that are not art spaces. So when I move through cities, I'm often stepping on glass or debris or rubbish and things feel in motion. And the work that you're standing on could have felt really, really heavy in here. And I wanted to insert elements that could be kicked around, that could be stepped on, that could move as much as the work outside is going to collect all sorts of things from the weather. So the, the pebbles, there are pebbles, there are little things cast these things will shift, and it was an, I think it was a valuable part of the work that there was something that was more in motion that continually is operating without me here. But I think the term of casual is also um, coming across in your work as a certain openness, openness to, on one hand, um, allow the work to change over time, but also open to work with the conditions that you find on a site. So for example, for the brickwork, we could only find one brick production plant uh, in the area around Vienna that still has these unfired bricks and they just have two types of bricks. So that's what you had to work with in a way. Um, maybe this, this kind of openness um, yeah, it's something that's very coherent in your work. And I was wondering if this is also something that you can relate to in your work um, as a director of an institution. I mean, maybe just to, to, to add one aspect, um, because you mentioned it already, like the, the kind of um, uh, the element of um, a kind of circle or a kind of uh, material feedback that um, the glass bottles which are found outside, um, that they find a way back in here as sculptures and they actually look really beautiful, these kind of melted uh, little um, alcohol bottles that are um, yeah, becoming very beautiful again. And, uh, but they still um, tell the story of like, um, I mean, I can imagine like somebody, um, I don't know, me in my youth um, sitting in the park and um, having this moment of like experiencing freedom and uh, thinking it's really great to be in a park late and um, having a drink with friends and uh, this kind of moment of euphoria um, that comes with uh, uh, youth or subcultural um, uh, involvement and experiences. And um, so that's, uh, that's coming in again and it still has these traces of um, uh, their past lives. And um, so this is kind of uh, happening in many ways in, uh, in, in the work, I guess, also with, with the um, you mentioned that uh, some of the clay that has been used for the uh, drainage outside has been, uh, some of the clay is coming from digging out here um, the holes for the subway system. So it's also like something that existed here, had a different, um, I don't know, was part of the earth and now it's back to the location and uh, has a different function. And it's also kind of drain and um, a kind of pipe, um, so something that uh, connects formally to uh, why it had to be dug out in the first place. So in a way, it's this kind of um, feedback loops that uh, point to, to um, previous moments and incorporates them and makes them visible. And that's maybe like um, now speaking about institutional practice. I guess that's. Um, if you talk about openness, openness can be also very much a cliche or uh, just a gesture, but um, it has to do with quite concrete um, communities or histories that are addressed or towards which an institution is opening itself. So in a way, the situation here with the garden is very beautiful because it's a neighbor. I don't know the history of um, this uh, relationship with the, the, the 
yeah, community garden, the kind of um, this, I don't know, self-built situation out there. But it's very beautiful and also in the kind of contrast and uh, unplannedness that uh, this is something that uh, happened here in some way. It would be interesting to, I don't know, I'm actually interested to find out how this happened. I noticed it before. Uh, but it's a kind of unlikely uh, neighborhood, also this um, observational um, juxtaposition, people in the pavilion looking outside, it's almost like made for it, uh, and vice versa, uh, the garden also is an ideal viewing situation with an, um, I guess, unconventional perspective into the exhibition space that's only to be experienced from there and not from the um, main entrance. So that's a kind of openness that um, creates a very specific relationship and um, I guess that's uh, interesting for me also in uh, terf, terms of an institutional practice, how uh, an organization can be an active um, participate, participant in a civic discourse or can be uh, an agent for to create um, relationships in a city that um, are new and um, are uh, creating, um, I don't know, a new um, framework for um, social relationships, yeah. Um, in order to create new work, um, you spend a lot of time at places and walking through cities and, and landscapes. Um, was there any other aspect that uh, really intrigued you here at Karlsplatz when you came here for site visits and, and looked around in the area? Yeah, I mean, it was interesting to me that because I, I hadn't I hadn't been here before and when I came here it was interesting that it was a thoroughfare space with the Kunsthaler on it and compared to the other venue which is more of a destination this one felt kind of looser but I think um, in making this making this project and making this work the one thing that drove the work even more than observation, were situations and experiences. And this work was made through different people and different situations and different experiences. And the ability of the materials to perform in whatever way they can. But I just sort of feel like I only know half of what I'm doing. And the other half just has to happen through time spent doing things. And there's a physicality to making work like this that still surprises me. I, I absolutely like don't have control over it and that's really interesting for me. Um, how did the projects in Bristol and Stockholm, for example, um, evolved over time? Did you notice any changes or reactions? Um, because some of your works are very subtle, many, very minimal in public space, so they can easily be overlooked also. So do you make any experience that people noticed or didn't notice the work? I mean, there was one uh, quite um, visible project we did in Stockholm, which was um, like very large, oh, actually different sized um, concrete boulders that we uh, inserted into a river and around the river that uh, or canal actually that was um, uh, in front of uh, the space of index and they were quite brightly colored also maybe in a similar way as, as these strings um, uh, inserting an um, unexpected uh, color into um, the project and so they were um, colored with um, concrete um, pigments like concrete stain yeah. And oxide yeah yeah so some were green some were uh, bluish uh, quite brightly bluish uh, or red uh, and since they were quite large and um, placed into the water it was really something that um, people uh, noticed and they were kind of um, inserted um, close to situations where in Sweden indeed like often very large um, boulders are used to I don't know um, demarcate uh, uh, driving way for cars or um, a sitting area at the water for people to hang out or so. And um, so in this situation we really noticed that people started using them, like uh, either um, also sitting on them or um, uh, some were also removed or removed, others were um, kind of um, swept away by the river and they um, because the water is quite dirty the ones which are which were placed in the water also changed um, 
the color over time um, pretty drastically. But it was something that really became uh, the kind of um, part of the everyday routine and uh, of people, like they noticed, people noticed it, and people talked to us about it. Um, so that was, uh, it became, um, I don't know, part of a narrative, like um, people were wondering what it is. And um, I don't know, it was also like, uh, I, yeah, art institutions are still these um, slightly strange actors in uh, a public discourse. So it made people also more aware of uh, what index is and what index is doing. Yeah. Yeah, I was even surprised that people noticed them because some of them are just entirely underwater. Yes, I guess maybe those were <laughs> some were very visible from bridges. Yeah. Because um, looking from above, you could see them, and especially if um, the water, water was more busy, uh, they became visible. Yeah. And people were curious. Yeah, I think it's very interesting that um, if some someone talks about your work, one necessarily has to talk about the site and the place as well, because mostly your work is very much connected to the site of its presentation and sometimes also the time of its presentation. And when we prepared the exhibition here in Vienna, I found it very interesting that you mentioned as one influence um, on your work, not a piece of art or a person, but a place. Um, and the place is Marfer, where you just spent two months on a residency at the Chinati Foundation. The Chinati Foundation is uh, founded by Donald Chutt in the 1980s um, and has the aim to um, preserve some large-scale installations in public space. And um, is also very well known in the field of contemporary art because of that foundation. But for you, it was not just the works on view that were interesting, but also the improvised use um, of material in the desert town of Mafer. And I just wanted to um, read a quick uh, quote from uh, Donald Chad's first uh, um, foundation catalog, where he said that it takes a great deal of time and thought to install work carefully. This should not always be thrown away. Most art is fragile, and some should be placed and never moved again. Somewhere a portion of contemporary art has to exist as an example of what the art and its context were meant to be. I think that is a quite interesting quote in relation to your work because I see your work as quite an um, uh, opposition to that because it's not made to stay at the place forever but it's made to make sense in a certain time frame, in a certain context. Um, can you maybe tell us a little bit more how you feel about that or if you think that's, yeah, what interests you in your work? Yeah, I'm, I'm really interested in giving the work permission not to exist beyond the time and place in which it's shown. So while I th thought that the Chinati Foundation was absolutely phenomenal in what Judd achieved there and in terms of the work's at the Chinati Foundation, often it was just one work. And I did think about that a lot when I was there because I, I suffer in art fatigue when I go into a museum or a gallery and I'm showing 50 works. And I just don't have that kind of stamina. And it was really interesting to be in the, in the foundation, sort of spending time with these works in an ongoing way. And it was like the Ronnie Horn works would just be, you know, two copper sculptures. And it was so completely satisfying and engrossing. And I thought about that in regards to making this project because I thought that how would it be if I just created one work here and what would that be? And I still think of this as one work. There were three components. But I do, I do think Judd had something going on and it was fascinating and I'm absolutely not that. So my work is... I mean, I can make a decision. I mean, making this work, I was so enjoying it because I got to make it up as I go along and I didn't mind living with those consequences. I'm not so strict on myself. And I think Judd had a lot of very strict rules that he adhered to and, and it's very, very different. But the work is here now and it's not going to exist beyond here. And I don't think that that's anything that isn't less in the work. It's just something else. 
context. It's more about um, the kind of social context and uh, what a place means um, to people and uh, especially um, as a kind of a site for activities. Um, because I mean that's maybe something uh, I absolutely share with you <laughs> that um, there's probably nothing more boring than uh, imagining exhibitions as things that um, I don't know have a stable condition. It's more I mean to me exhibitions are still like uh, interesting as sites where things happen as space as spaces of activities. Um, this can be more um, uh, outspokenly happening like. Um, something that's um, um, happening in the show uh, or it's something that um, is uh, a show doing to people uh, that it um, really sets something in motion and that can be also something that's um, more implicit and maybe a more internal process but that's something that I would demand <laughs> of an exhibition so um, obviously it's not nothing is uh, more boring than uh, a space which is just about um, I don't know passive consumption or so um, so in, in that uh, way, I guess, in, in, in an institutional practice, I also uh, think of a place and how to shape it so that it um, actually allows um, exhibitions to become performative machines or so. And um, there's maybe just like one thing I wanted to <laughs> say, because um, in one of the very early books you um, had a text reprinted by Simone Forti, mm -hmm. which is maybe um, um, an artist um, who's not obvious in relation to your work. She's a dancer, choreographer, an artist who produced um, objects that um, are almost like um, props for um, choreographed activities. And um, I found uh, one quote by her very impressive, which is about um, choreography or dance that she describes as a way of measuring space. So um, starting um, to take possession of a, um, a stage or a space is for her also like um, measuring that space in relation to one's own body and what uh, one can do. And in a way, I had to think about um, that quote again when um, hearing about your plans here for the, for the exhibition space because the floor is also in a way um, uh, something that um, gives us a possibility to, to find a relationship to the space and to its surrounding. It's a platform to uh, look outside and um, at the same time um, observe the kind of details um, that are lying on the floor. And uh, from there on, um, I mean, there's so many um, stories <laughs> incorporated in the uh, elements on the floor and in the patterns that you um, engraved or carved into the um, stones into the bricks. So this is like where then, while we're in the space, it uh, still connects to uh, the outside, but not just on a kind of um, design level, but really on uh, the level of why things are the way they are, and to the kind of reasons and yeah, social relations and stories, which I like very much. I think it's interesting you bring up Simone Forti, because I was thinking about this this work and I was thinking about how when you enter the space you step directly on it and there's actually no one vantage point to look at the work mm. that in order to see the work you have to move so I'm requiring a lot of my viewer because they can't stand and passively look at the thing they have to they have to physically move throughout the room in order to see it and then they also get to step off of it and it was important for me that the bricks didn't fill the entire space because I think it's important you have a moment where you're not on the work as well or else that seems kind of quite dogmatic or something. But for me, there's just, there's no way to see this exhibition without physically moving. And I was wondering about how the viewer might feel about that. It almost seems bossy, but it's up to them, you know, how much they want to move and how much they want to observe and look. Yeah. I think that everybody's quite excited maybe to do that now in the space. So maybe um, we can uh, open up uh, for questions in the audience, if there are any. Okay, um, then 
I suggest that um, after our casual conversation, uh, I just um, want to do a more formal part be um, because there were so many people involved in uh, producing that exhibition. I want to like want to uh, thank a couple of people. First of all, thank you very much, Kate. <laughs> it was a great honor and an enormous pleasure to work with you on the project. There are so many things I learned through the exhibition, not just about materials um, and production methods, but also about collaboration, first and foremost. Thank you, Nikolaus, for creating the opportunity to realize that exhibition here. Um, I would also like to thank our great support team that Kate already mentioned. They have done incredible work in preparing and realizing the installations on view. Um, this is Chris Fortescue, Scott Hayes, Lazar Lutakov, Steven Sepke, Andreas Schweger, Marc Dumoulin, Harry Adrian, Dietmar Hochhauser, Bruno Hoffmann, Alfred Lenz, and of course our construction management, Johnny Dibocchi and Danilo Pacher, and for the exhibition management, Martina Pieper. Really, all of you have done an astonishing job and put great efforts into this exhibition. Thank you very much. I would also like to extend my thanks to our cooperation partners and production sites. Um, there was the Ceramic Studio of the University of Applied Arts, especially the head of the department, Martina Zwölfer, Gerald Pfaffel and Maria Viala. The Kuchler House in Pottendorf uh, and the class artist Peter Kuchler III the Ziegelwerk Litzi in Bad Erlach, uh, and the Goldsmith Peter, Herbert, sorry, Pe Herbert Pelzmann. Um, Creative New Zealand for supporting that exhibition and the Embassy of New Zealand in Vienna for providing the wine tonight for the opening. Um, furthermore, I'd like to thank the team of Kunsthalle, um, Martin Wagner and uh, Wolfgang Brunner for their work on the booklet, and our press and marketing department, Katharina Baumgarten and her team, Stephanie Obermeier and Susanne Fernandez-Silva. And of course, thank you very much, Axel, for joining us tonight and participating in the talk. Yeah, I hope you enjoy the exhibition and have a great evening.